Hello everyone. Uh, today we're going to be learning about artificial and natural selection. Uh, this, you know, these are some ideas that are central to Darwin's ideas of evolution. Uh, in the level 2 book, this is section 15-3. Uh, and in the honors book, the section's a little different. But the concepts are the same. So here we go. Let's talk about artificial selection for a minute here. Uh, artificial selection is when humans select which organisms are going to breed to create the next generation. Humans choose from all the natural variation among the members of that species that are available to them and they mate the ones together that have traits that are desirable to the people that are choosing. Uh, this is obviously an artificial process because out in the wild humans aren't involved in which wild animals breed with other wild animals but with domesticated animals and plants artificial selection has been going on for thousands of years. We already learned about this idea. We called it selective breeding when we were talking about indirect uh, genetic modification of organisms. Uh, selective breeding is the same thing as artificial selection. Humans select which organisms mate and we do the selecting based on desired phenotypes that we like in whatever creature it is. Any domestic animal, plant, anything you use for a pet, anything you see in the grocery store, they're all products of selective breeding which is also known as artificial selection. Here's a great illustration of artificial selection. If you look up in picture one, you see there's all sorts of natural variation just due to different genes in a wild population of corn. There are different sized ears. I'm sure the ears taste different. I'm sure there's different colorations of the kernels. I'm sure there's different heights of the stalks of corn. There's just all sorts of variety. People realize that if you eat the ears of corn that have the less desirable traits and you keep the ones and use those to plant to make the, ne the next generation, the corn that has desirable traits, here we're focused on the size of the ears. If you were to do that in picture two, you look down in picture three, if that same phenotype was selected for over and over again throughout many generations, you look at picture four, all of your crop is going to have that phenotype. And here we're looking for size of the ears of corn. So what we did in picture three was uh, humans ate the ears that were not perfect and then used the ones that were perfect as seeds to create the next generation. In doing this, we've selected artificially what we want as far as ears of corn go. The same process applies to dogs and cats and livestock other plants we use for food, ornamental plants. This is how all of these things have come to be. Darwin was a scientist. He knew of the predominant scientific theories of his day. He knew what artificial selection was. He knew that people had been doing artificial selection or selective breeding ever since people had been around. Darwin thought to himself, I wonder if there's a process in nature that's similar to what humans are doing with this artificial selection. Darwin called this natural selection and what Darwin thought was there must be a process out in the wild where nature selects which creatures are the best suited to survive and reproduce. So he called his theory natural selection. Let's take a look at how natural selection works. Think back to ecology for a minute. We talked about some ideas in ecology that other scientists have put different words on, but Darwin knew from another scientist that there was this thing called the struggle for existence happening in nature. And the struggle for existence is basically there are limited necessities of life. There's only so much food, there's only so much living space, so much water, only so many mates. Those are all necessities of life. I told you before, life isn't like a Disney movie when you're out in the wild. There's not just unlimited everything and everybody's happy and sings a song at the end of the movie. Remember we already talked about this back in ecology though. Why does this struggle exist? Why is there a struggle for existence? Well, if you think about it, it's because these necessities are not unlimited. We called this competition back when we were studying ecology. And we said there are competition for limited resources and this is just what happens. If you could picture in your, in your mind just a field that is going to go through secondary succession. 
certain plants are going to are going to move in. The ones that can grow taller are going to be more successful because they're going to get that limited resource of sunlight. The ones that can grow their roots deeper, they are winning the struggle for existence because they're getting that limited resource known as water. So the struggle for existence, we call it a competition. You know about it. Darwin knew about it, and he used this idea to further his thinking to develop his theory of evolution. So Darwin had to think to himself. He understood what, he, what would motivate humans to do artificial selection. We're choosing creatures based on just whatever appeals to us. Well, in nature, he decided that the most fit creatures would be the ones to do the surviving and would be the ones to do the reproducing. So the word fit is a shortened form of this, of this word fitness, and that's the ability to survive and reproduce in a certain environment. If you look down here at the picture, a fast cheetah is obviously more fit to survive in its habitat than a slow one. Well, why is it? What makes this cheetah so much more fit than maybe some other cheetahs in its environment? Here's another vocabulary word that you have to get very familiar with. Darwin said fitness is a result of these things called adaptations. Now, as people, we think of adapting as changing our behavior. We think of, if you go to a new high school, you have to adapt to things there. You have to adapt to the way the principal is, the way the teachers are. You have to adapt to the timing of all your classes and the new friends you're going to make. That's not what adaptations are in biology. In biology, adaptations are inherited characteristics. If you all remember, inherited characteristics are controlled by the DNA that you inherit from your mom and dad. It's the same thing with our cheetah here. So fitness is a result of adaptations. If you look at this cheetah, there are many adaptations that make this cheetah more fit to survive in its habitat. Take a look at it. Um, things that go into making it fast would be things like its lung capacity, its muscle tone, its bone structure. Uh, if you even think about things like its senses, it has to have a very highly developed sense of hearing, sense of sa um, sight, sense of smell. It has to have claws and teeth that will enable it to capture its prey. Look at the coat pattern. If that cheetah was an albino, that would, be a, that would not be an adaptation. If this was an albino cheetah, it wouldn't be the most fit. But because this one has this coat pattern that allows it to be camouflaged in its environment, that's another one of its adaptations. So all of the adaptations of this cheetah would make it more fit to survive in its environment. This term is synonymous with natural selection. Survival of the fittest, you can think of this as survival of the most fit. So the organisms of a species or in a population of an area that have the best adaptations that make them the most fit to survive, they're going to survive. That's all this word means. So think about it. Fast cheetahs, if we just focus on this one adaptation of speed, a fast cheetah is going to be more fit to survive than a slow one would. Um, natural selection, survival of the fittest, they're really the same thing. We can use these words interchangeably in our class. Organisms that have the best adaptations are the most fit, and they're going to win in the struggle for existence. They're going to be able to reproduce more. They're going to pass on their genes that allowed them to have these adaptations, and that's what's going to happen. If you think about an unfit cheetah, it's going to be using an awful lot of energy to chase down prey that it might not catch. Let's say it's a slow cheetah. It's not going to catch as much food. It's not going to eat as much. If a cheetah is starving, reproduction isn't really that important to it because it's just trying to get enough food to eat. So the most fit organisms reproduce more because they're healthier. And that's, Dar that's Darwin's basic principle here to drive his theory. I'll start to wrap things up just a little bit here. So just to review, what are the most fit organisms able to do that the lesser fit ones cannot over the course of their lives? Well, the answer is reproduction. They're able to reproduce more and they're able to pass on those genes that produce those adaptations that made them so fit. 
And then if we look here, when organisms reproduce, what do they pass on? Well, I saw I just said this to you. They're passing on their DNA. They're passing on the genes that made them so fit. Organisms that are not fit, think about an albino cheetah. They're not going to eat as much. They're not going to be as healthy. We would expect that they're not going to live as long. An organism that doesn't live as long isn't going to reproduce at all, or it's not going to reproduce as much. So it's not going to have the opportunity to pass on the genes that would make it be an albino, that would make it be less fit. So logically speaking here, um, genes that don't contribute to fitness, we would expect that they would eventually get lost because they're just not being passed on as much as the genes that would make organisms more fit. Okay, here's where I got all the images and there's uh, where I got the definitions for the section. Uh, please review this video if you need to. Uh, be ready for a possible pop quiz next time I see you on this material. Watch this presentation as much as you need to. Please take a look at the textbook as well. Uh, when you come back to class, we're going to be doing a lab activity where we're going to simulate uh, different adaptations to make certain degrees of fitness to show which organisms win the struggle for existence and which organisms natural selection would select to make up the next generation of organisms.